Yeah, good morning. I'm, I'm very pleased being here and it's a great pleasure to see you all that early in the morning. <laughs> it's quite early, I think. And um, thank you for the invitation. And actually, I'm very much looking forward to the second lecture, but also to the discussion group and discuss with you what decolonizing urbanism might be. What is it? So, because it's a huge question. Um, there's only one thing I would add um, to my person, a little bit also to clarify a bit that I'm speaking from a European metropolitan diasporic position, which means I've born in Europe and I grew up in Europe. And, um, and I seek to investigate the coloniality of urban space and in particular on European cities. So that's what I'm going to map out um, a bit on the geographies of knowledge production, but I will have an emphasis on Europe. So let's see if that works. And so that's the overview of my talk. First, I will talk about postcolonial epistemologies of the urban. Then I will talk about geographies of knowledge production and then on metropolitan colonialism and explain what I mean by that. And then at the end, I come to the conclusion. But first of all, as the whole summer school is entitled Decolonizing Urbanism, Actually, the question is, what is decolonization? Um, here, actually, I bring a flyer of that conference, which we did in September 2012 in Berlin at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, with the title Decolonize the City. And it was very much an activist academic conference, and in particular, having mostly the perspectives of black and people of color communities and their work and their experience on the city. And I hope you can read it. Um, the citation and the definition I bring is of Syed Hussan, who is a Canada-based um, activist, and he wrote, decolonization is a dramatic reimagining of relationships with land, people, and the state. Much of this requires study. It requires conversation. It is a practice. It is an unlearning. So this citation indicates it's, on one hand, a long process, and on the other hand, it's referring to, very <coughs> to the three important aspects, the land, the people, and the state. Because that, the state is very much organizing this relationship, for example, through property rights or citizenship rights. And I think we, can, we will look at that throughout the whole summer school. So my argument is that the neoliberal urban transformation builds on colonial and imperial social socialities by creating social identities through ra raciality, religiosity, gender and sexuality, and class identities, but also like um, normative body and um, um, imaginations. These identities are carefully conceptualized towards a modern understanding of citizenship and draw from knowledge of colonial citizenship. This knowledge is nowadays still at work, although these identities are contested incorporated and again defined, but continuously unstable and fixed at the same time. To reproduce a racial, gender, sexual, able-bodied and class hierarchy in various societies and as well in urban societies. Ah, and now I will have another announcement because out of that conference there is a book and that book is now available. I, I still haven't had my hands on the book, so, but it's available. And it's in, uh, I have to admit, it's all in German. We translated some work from Spanish and English into German. So now I come to the second part on postcolonial epistemologies of the urban. And urban studies, I consider a wide ranging field of historical, architectonic, planning, social, and cultural studies, which study from the various disciplinary perspectives of daily life the forms of representation and the infrastructures of the urban. Based on the work of Henri Lefebvre, many scholars consider urban space more than a process of social production and not just a spatial pro object. Therefore, different forms of social relations, which are articulated through social hierarchies, differentiated by various categories, are shaping the urban form and defining access to infrastructures or legitimizes areas of of abandonment. So urban space is not only there, it is made and reproduced. And colonial epistemologies 
are to find in the field of urban studies as well. Within the field of urban studies, many have criticized the focus on Eurocentric concept and the omission to consider colonialism as a relevant factor for producing and shaping cities and modeling forms of urbanity. Whereas understanding of modernity and the relevance of industrialization are at the core of urban theory production. There are several models of the city, such as the world city, global city, mega city, European city, oriental city, and many more. These different models carry on their side of knowledge production and as well the de developmentalist approach to the city. The division of knowledge production is quite apparent for the research on one hand on the mega cities, cities in the global south or in the non-western hemisphere, and on the other hand the research on the metropoles, mostly cities of industrialized and western cities. And actually I'm working at the Center for Metropolitan Studies and it's very interesting to see what kind of cities we look at and what cities we don't look at because I did also before mega cities research and it was very much divided. <clears throat> this division of knowledge production derives from the ontological model that mega cities should develop and that there are lacking infrastructures. A deficit oriented view whereas cities in the western metropoles are the ontological set of urban epistemology such as global city and world city and are the headquarters of financial capital and political decision making. Whereas postcolonial urbanism, so what is what I'm interested in, I'm looking at, engages with the making of the city in its colonial imperial dimension. Or as, and as for example, Anthony King, since almost 30 years, emphasizes that without understanding the role and function of cities in the colonial empire, we won't fully understand its role within the globalized economy. But still, this perspective is very marginal in urban studies. Although we find a lot of work on the effects and impacts of capitalism and neoliberalism and critically engagements with uneven development. But the colonial dimension is not an important analytical lens within urban studies. So now I would like to introduce the coloniality of power and the coloniality of urban. Um, there are decolonial theorists such as Anibal Quijano, Malta Mignono, Maria Lugones, who have argued that modernity is, condi is conditional to coloniality and coloniality modernity. So that we can't understand one without the other as they constitute each other. Therefore, imaginations of the modern city are closely tied to the formations of colonial cities in the context of European colonial expansion. This point of departure formulated by decolonial theorists, is important towards a field of urban studies looking at colonial legacies and from there to develop a critical approach towards contemporary forms of urban coloniality. And Anibal Quijano conceptualized an understanding of the coloniality of power. <coughs> it was a decolonial subaltern study, a group of intellectuals based in the Latin Americas and they were inspired by the Indian subaltern studies. So the focus was on subalterity, oppression and colonization within the Latin American context and to discuss the various processes of colonization and decolonization taking place in the Americas. And one quite famous research group was called the Latin American Modernity slash Coloniality Research Program, where the relation of colonialism, power and racism was central to the intellectuals and to reflect within the process of knowledge production. Anibal Quijano, a socialist from Peru, outlined the basis for the ongoing continuation of racism by the fundamental axis of colonial slash modern capitalism through the idea of race to structure, or better to divide, the global population in citizens and subjects, in colonizers and colonized, and place people in a racial and social hierarchy. And he wrote, I quote, the racial axis has a colonial origin and character, but it has proven to be more durable and stable than the colonialism in whose matrix it was established." Quote end. So Quijano showed in his work the constitutive, constitutive relation between colonialism, Eurocentrism and capitalism, which is a foundation to develop and maintain over the centuries a global coloniality of power. <coughs> 
This power, or better, the legitimation of the coloniality of power, was inscribed in science, um, culture, and society. So in many ways, the coloniality of power has shaped our understanding of university, knowledge production, history and time, social classification, economies, and so on. And through this various dimension, an understanding of colonial Europe was centered, legitimized, and naturalized as a given. Europe was conceptualized as a geography center, as Eurocentrism versus a periphery, as a historical ontology, as modern developed versus traditional underdeveloped, as an anthropological condition, as civilized versus primitive, as an economic norm, as capitalist versus informal or ethnic economy, or as a specific gender relation, as heteronormative and two gender-based sexuality, and made seemingly plausible by the inscription of Europeanness into bodies, into white male bodies versus brown and black bodies. So as I understand power in that colonial matrix, which Kihano has described, the control of that power is through the following. First of the control of the economy, through land appropriation, exploitation of labor, control of natural resources. Second, to the control of authority, through institutions and armies. Third, the control of gender and sexuality, by family and education. And fourth, the control of subjectivity and knowledge, through epistemology, education, and the formation of subjectivities. So the question here is, <clears throat> How is the global coloniality of power reproduced through the city or through urbanism? And to ask who is cap capable of this control and what does this control acquire? This control acquires on one hand institutions of territorial planning, of education and nation building, and on the other hand the colonial matrix is inscribed in the neoliberal world making if you consider the bodies being exploited, precarized and informalized on a global scale but as well on the urban scale. So Kihano sees this dimension as a set of the coloniality of power, which forms a precondition to enable global capitalism, as hereby it is possible to comprehensively control the capitalist, the capitalist production. And he writes, Europe's hegemony over the new model of global power concentrated all forms of the control of subjectivity, culture, and especially knowledge and the production of knowledge under its hegemony. And understanding power through the analytical model of Quijano, the direct relation between coloniality and capitalism slash neoliberalism are apparent. Therefore, I argue that we not only have to analyze the political economical dimension of social relations, but as well to analyze them in the context of racism and racialization and to critically investigate the epistemic preconditions of capitalism. However, despite a schematized division of a rich global north and a poor global south, poverty and social injustice are not only taking place in the global south, but are also a common phenomenon in the global north. And especially its cities play a role in the maintenance of the divide by organizing the globalized flow of capital and by sustaining international economic relationships beyond national borders. And following Wallerstein's world system theory, the cities of the global north thereby reflect the core periphery relation in a, on a micro level by reproducing racialized social hierarchies like the global scale. So the divide in the northern cities is the most pronounced in the form of ethnic, ethnicized division of labor and racially segregated neighborhoods. More precisely, white citizens are more likely to be working in higher paid jobs and living in better maintained areas of the city, whereas citizens of color are more likely to be forced into lower, low, low paid precarized work and disadvantaged neighborhoods. So this, if this divide epitomizes the contradictions inherent to what is perceived as a modern city of the global north, what is primarily associated with a generally accessible prosperity as well as progress growth and democracy. So a decolonial perspective challenges Western-centric epistemologies of science and modernity and insists on a <coughs> self-critical re-examination. It is of utmost importance 
to attend to the complexity of intertwined relations of power resulting from class, gender, race and body, heteronormativity, homonationalism and other categories of oppression. Decolonial thinking suggests a perspective that is not only about the decolonization of knowledge and knowledge production, but also demands for a diversification and a plurality of perspectives. Now looking at the geographies of knowledge produ production and in particular in the urban field of urban studies, because of the very many historicities of colonialism and the very regional differences, several contexts of knowledge production need to be differentiated. So studies of cities in Australia, New Zealand, United States and Canada focus on the urbanity of settler colonialism and who look at the continuation of colonial relations which are manifest and reproduced in urban space. It is here where an indigenous perspective on the relation between people, land and the state has been developed and articulated. Geographies of settler colonial theory conceive colonialism as very present and as a matter of dispossession. It is a dispossession of people from their land which is accompanied by the disposition of history, language and culture. And under the surface of modern nation states, the reality of settler colonialism is very present. So settler colonial relations haven't been replaced by capitalist ones, but rather reproduce racist relations. This is, for example, advice for the US American context. As an enslaving society, the United States fought a war about the abolition of slavery and to free the enslaved ones. But the former enslaved are now disproportionately incarcerated and considered as criminals and dispossessed of their future. Although the war for the abolition for slavery is foundational to the United States, there are the genocidal wars against indigenous people, dispossessed of their territories, their histories and their ancestors. And their realities are made of the living and the past. But reparation, justice and healing seem not to be part of their future determined in their own sovereignty. And as the protest in 2016 against the Dakota pi pipeline was after 30 years an important moment of indigenous resistance in the settler colonial context of the US, but very marginal to the discussions here in Europe. It is in the US American context some important theories have been developed to analyze the constitutive relation between racism and capitalism. The history of the US is not only a history of oppression, but as well of resistance, and the struggle of a diverse range of groups for citizenship and the demand of justice and self-determination. Insofar, critical race theory and indigenous studies developed in this context by, for example, Kimberly Crenshaw, Jacqueline Keeler, Brenda Norrell, John Trudell, Gloria Ansoldua, Angela Davis, Cedric Robinson, Bell Hooks, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore are important references to develop, identify and analyze racialized and racist social realities in Europe. But we must consider the various social constellations when we look at racism and racialized societies on both sides of the Atlantic, because on one hand the US are a settler colonial nation based on the dispossession of indigenous people, and having been an enslavement society in which still the prison industrial complex is considered as a legacy of this former colonialism. And later I will discuss the present coloniality within the European context, which I see as an ongoing racialization and racism on the European continent. Other works have their point of departure in cities of the global south, in former colonized countries and their cities. From there, the relevance of European colonial planning and Eurocentristic concept of cities in time of globalization is analyzed. Here is the work of Aiwa Wong, Ong, Brenda Yeo, Ananya Roy and Naza El Sayad, and as I mentioned before, the work of Anthony King. Some of the work analyze the contested notion of the world city in its relation to the megacity and critically review the division of knowledge production within the field of urban studies. The geography of knowledge production is defined by the colonial experience of distant colonies from the metropolis and how the process of colonization has shaped and influenced former empires and turned territories 
of interest for the colonizer in nowadays urbanized areas. Through the process of decolonization and in the making of post-colonial nation-making, these former colonial cities are important headquarters of contemporary urban development. Other study, studies look at the transfer, transfer between colonial cities and the metropolis and the impact in colonial urban planning. Some colonies and their cities were regarded as laboratories of urban planning. One famous example is the work of Le Corbusier, who studied the colonies and built some of his houses in Morocco, back then a French protectorate. He was not only important to the modern movement of architecture and urbanism, but as well he experimented with forms of housing and renderings of the future in that colonial context. Other work in the field of urban history look at the entangled histories of world expositions and their attempt not only to showcase the success of colonization, but as well to educate the common people and the metropoles about the colonies. And a recent study by Giovanni Picker looks at the segregation of Romani people in European cities and connects his analysis with colonial templates of urban development in the colonies. So the work of Picker makes an intervention in the field of urban sociology and in the process and looks at the process of segregation where some groups are racialized and legitimized to displace them to the periphery. And therefore he understands colonial legacies as contemporary forms of segregation in European cities. And now I want to move from the other geographies of knowledge production to Europe. The presence of the margins or of colonial subjects within metropoles have been researched and the topic of several work on cities such as London, Paris and Berlin. One aspect in the process of decolonization is the formation of diasporic subjects. The research on the postcolonial diaspora is an important field of postcolonial studies. After Bra, a British sociologist, developed the concept of diaspora space in 1996. Deriving from a feminist and postcolonial perspective on working on social inequalities, she was interested how different regimes of power intersect. Her notion of diaspora space reflects a conceptual category that includes, and I quote, entanglements of genealogies of dispersion with those of staying put. It is thus the contested, negotiated and challenged space of belonging, identity and exclusion which he considers as diaspora space, because herein relations of space, identity and body making are produced. These processes respond, navigate and contest each other and inform the other and as well the ones who are staying put about its place and the world and in the space. Therefore, Bra emphasizes the entanglement and not just the construction of the diasporic other. It is a common space or the shared space constituted by the production of difference and the reciprocal referencing. Therefore, she offers a conceptual framework to analyze questions of deterritorialized and territorialized belonging in its spatial dimension. And that in the diasporic spaces of Europe, an important feature are processes of racialization. So I assume in my research that the decolonization of Europe is not yet complete, rather, that it is a process evident in da daily colonial encounters and the contemporary urban context. Insofar, the following questions are of interest for me. First, how do colonial encounters and relations in the European urban context take place and persist? And second, how, when and where are colonial encounters questioned, challenged and resisted? As Europe imagines itself as innocent project, as Gloria Weckers argues in her work on white innocence, Europe locates racism and colonialism somewhere else and far away from its own borders, as Fatima El Tayeb argues in her book European Others. It may be that non-European territories have been colonized and perhaps as well violently are conquered, but this took all place not within the European borders. The impact of colonial violence is not regarded as a consti constitutional matter for European societies or for the case here, metropolitan societies. 
The imagination of the European countries establishes a narrative of the enlightened, democratic and equal Europe. And the inequality within European nations are analyzed in the framework of migration and national integration, but not as a matter of critical race or post-colonial studies. Though the constitution of here in Europe is not only a singular national identity, but as well the constitution of a supranational entity. And the articulation of a shared European identity reflects in recent history two important historical events. On one hand, the experience of National Socialism and the Holocaust, and on the other hand, the end of the Cold War with its breakdown of former socialist states. The formulation of a shared European identity after these major historical events omitted the postcolonial historicity, although the European nations were significant player within the colonial project and part of that history. Despite that shared European history, the various national, colon the various national colonial histories unfolds very differently, with different colonial practices and relations. But considering the debates nowadays on migration, refugees, national identity and urban living, there are many similarities which I consider to be connected to colonial history and the coloniality of power. So what do I mean by metropolitan colonialism? Hereby I refer to a set of cultural, social, juridical and institutional discrimination along several social categories such as race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexuality, class. Metropolitan colonialism addresses the rearrangements made in metropolitan societies when colonial subjects have arrived and claimed their right of citizenship. And I include forms of racial profiling, ethnic-based social politics, territorializing social politics, presentation of colonial history without acknowledging its violence, representing the colonial plunder in the metropoles as legal property and denying the brutal effects of colonial violence for the colonized people and more as part of metropolitan colonialism. Hereby I consider an assemblage of colonial tactics and strategies to govern different people within the metropoles which has nowadays turned into contemporary rhetorics of migration, integration and diversity. So Europe has a long history of unmaking bodies from their land and producing post-colonial others in a vari vari variety of subjectivities to maintain that colon coloniality of power. By referring to settler colonial theory, I like to unsettle Europe's coloniality and develop from, a, from there a perspective of anti-colonial coalitions within the European context, which considers itself as coloni colonialism lessness and racelessness although being simultaneously referred to as the birthplace of humanity. I assume that the logics of coloniality produce very different notions of belonging, sovereignty and displacement within national corpuses. And I'm interested in the following question. How to seek and build anti-colonial coalitions within Europe? A place, a continent, a project where the question of land and territorial sovereignty is framed by very different national understanding of the former colonizer and has led to fragmented groups of postcolonial others in European metropoles. By asking this question, I build hereby on the work of European intellectuals such as Gloria Wecker, Herbert Alejandro Martina, Fatima El Tayeb, Jen Harita Vaughan, Maisha Eggers, Encarnacion Rodriguez Gutierrez, and Huria Butelja for France. And just to mention some of the names of contemporary intellectuals of decolonial thinking and practicing. As a descendant of former colonized subjects, being myself an Indo, and Indos migrated after decolonization from Dutch Indies to the Netherlands, I'm involved in different forms of intersectional, anti-racist, Asian German activism and experience the possibilities and the limits of activism in a decolonial horizon. And there are the following two observations which I like to share with you. First, 
Looking at the movements of resistance within Europe, like the Decoloniality Europe group, groups in Germany as people of color movements, moved by Romnia and Sintessa, black people, Muslim people, Asian people, migrants, refugees. They demand their rights to education, are living in the metropoles. During protests, groups occupy public spaces and houses and other build solidarity networks. But at the same time, to these practices of solidarity, there are a lot of tensions about identity and what constitutes the we of resistance. It seems that the various racialized groups within European nations and across Europe are quite fragmented and disconnected from each other. And second, the other aspect I want to share is a conversation taking place between the US, Canada and European countries about so-called learning lessons for Europe on immigration from Canada and US. Within this dialogue, US and Canada are reproduced as receiving immigration countries who through the rhetoric of multi multiculturalism seems to accommodate a diverse population. But these policy dialogues eradicate the settler colonial con condition and continue the state violence not only against First Nations, but as well against refugees seeking asylum. By orchestrating national measure measurements of immigration, which are widely confused with the right to seek asylum, the settler colonial condition is written off the map through this dialogue. And my interest is to look at the understanding of colonization as dispossession and how questions of land sovereignty might be suitable for the European context. Through the, through the urban and our understanding of the urban, race, racism and racialized societies are produced and maintained. As race is not only inscribed into modernity or better, is conditional to modernity, it is as well into our understanding of the urban. But race is not everywhere the same, as it has been translated, rearticulated, and frames different hierarchies of embodiment. And I want to emphasize that we need to review the geographies of knowledge production and how these geographies of knowledge production inform us. But who is we? The we who is living in cities of the global north? Or the we who is a community of scholars in the field of urban studies? And if so, what constitutes a community of interdisciplinary scholars? Or the we who is a formation of diasporic people being othered and racialized in metropolitan societies? Although there are many we's, here I understand us as the ones who are sitting in this room and very, with very different relation to the university, to their geographies, but all in the colonial, either as a post-colonial condition or as a decolonial perspective. <clears throat> My research looks at the effects of colonialism not out of Europe, but within Europe and metropolitan societies. As racism is still alive, which we can observe in the last years in different national contexts, where national identities are debated against the other, when the arrival of refugees and migrants is perceived as a threat and seem to legitimize the militarization of outer borders and as well within European cities. Insofar, I became interested in the question of possessing history and being dispossessed of history. And it is a tension between temporality and reality when the post-colonial other within Europe enters the European narrative, not only as being displaced from the territory, but as well displaced from the larger narrative of European history. In that vein, I like to showcase three historical moments of research on metropolitan colonialism, which we might conceive as well as European post-colonial urbanism and are interwoven moments of the past, the now and the future. So this is a case looking at urban colonial, or looking at an urban colonial intervention and uh, at the um, establishment of so-called colonial quarters in European metropoles. Um, there is a symbol in the so-called Afrikanisches Viertel. You have two colonial quarters in Amsterdam, the Indische Bird and Afrikaanse Bird. And here on that left side, you see our name street of that colonial quarters in Amsterdam. And 
Paris Cartier Africain and as well Antwerp, Antwerp has an African suburb. And Brit means neighborhood. And here on the right side, you see the nowadays political contestation about the naming of these colonial quarters, the honoring of colon, uh, colon, colonial violence, and the demand to rename these colonial quarters. The second case is to look at ethnological collections which I consider as infrastructures of colonialism. Because now in these ethnological collections we have many questions of reparations, restitution, and the question where are the objects coming from. And also connected not only to question of object, but also with the question of human remains. The people, I, uh, the, people. <laughs> the pictures I brought, I don't know if you can see them very well, that on the left and on the right side are photographs which I made in Amsterdam in the Tropen Museum. And actually that um, is an installation to show the white gaze or the white European gaze in anthropological research. And there you have like a table of eye colors to define races of people. So actually these infrastructures are producing a lot of knowledge of who are people, where people are from and connect the idea of race with geographies. And then here in the middle, that's a poster of a campaign, of a post-colonial uh, campaign in Berlin. Um, and it's asking, um, oh gosh, I didn't. <laughs> Have you seen Beutekunst? Um, ex not exploited, but... Um, hmm? Plundered art. Have you seen already plundered art and uh, showing a famous statue of one of the museums in Berlin? And that is the case for now, for what is going on now in the ethnological collections and what would it mean the role and infrastructure of these collections under the condition of postcolonial transformations. And then what is the future and who defines the future? I assume I was talking about that yesterday. What would it mean to decolonize the future? And actually this is to look at um, urban development plannings after the end of the Cold War, after 18, uh, 1989. Because in that formation of a new Europe and a formation of new power regimes within the global economy, you can find several examples where a colonial um, narrative enters into urban development. And I brought here three examples. The very famous example of Berlin um, is like the um, establishing of the Humboldt Forum, which is connected as well to the Planwerk Innenstadt, an ongoing urban development process. And it's introducing Humboldt, the Humboldt brothers, um, as an example of enlightened education, but silencing the colonial um, setting and also the colonial production, the colonial production of knowledge. And it's quite, um, has a having quite impact on the new uh, Berlin. Then here in the middle, that is a picture from the expo in 1992 in Sevilla. Um, it was under the motto in the age of um, discoveries and it was back then already very much contested because it was a colonial affirmation of the colonial expansion and um, discovery. And then on the right, you see uh, the Vas Vasco de Gama Tower in Lisbon from 1998. It is also connected to the establishment of an expo uh, site in Lisbon. And as well, I also could refer to Hamburg, to Hafen City University, which is making a lot of um, connection to the colonial and global um, roots and empires um, it had. And so this I would consider as veins where to look at to understand metropolitan colonialism nowadays in Europe. So coming to the end, on decolonizing urbanism, and I think it will be also part 
um, throughout the discussion today, but also on Friday on decolonizing um, the classroom. I also think it's a matter of decolonizing methodologies. And here I refer to Linda Tui Weiss Smith's work on decolonizing methodologies. Although her work is developed within a settler colonial situation, where she as a former colonized subject and as an indigenous person enters the colonial enterprise of academic research. I want to consider her work to the colonial situation in Europe. By referring to her work, I see the similarity that research not only in New Zealand and as well in Europe is a colonial enterprise with different legacies and different contestation. But the European context does not, does not offer an indigenous perspective per se for a diasporic or migrant perspective. Although I like to mention the French party of the indigenous, Le Parti des Indigènes, who explicitly address their being as former colonial subjects, as indigenous, within the French metropolitan society by using the colonial vocabulary which differentiates between citizens and indigenous. And on the other hand, I'm also aware that the notion of indigeneity within the European context is as well claimed by European white supremacists to claim a naive and indigenous position while banalizing and ignoring the colonial texture of knowledge and identity production outside of Europe and through European settlers in the other parts of the world. <laughs> Therefore, I suggest at this point that the Maori notion of indigeneity developed here in that work cannot, cannot be translated to the European context and needs carefully referred to. Having said this, I want to focus the Smith's approach to decolonize research and how that matter was in my own research. I quote, many indigenous researchers have struggled individually to engage with the disconnections that are apparent between the demands of research on one side and the realities they encounter amongst their own and other indigenous communities with whom they share lifelong relationships on the other side, quote end. Smith hints here to the demands of research leading to disconnections of academic research implicates not only colonial notions, but as well colonial practices and assumptions. The notion of field and the relation of research object and subject. And the notion of field implies several ca characteristics. A separation between the researcher and his or her field. A field as somehow a well-defined territory which has clear boundaries and a distance between the field and the researcher. And through this conceptual understanding of the res researcher as outsider, it was assumed to be a neutral observer. In anthropology, where fieldwork was a methodological framing, to have conversations and relationships between a researching and a research person. This assumption has been critically discussed and introduced a postcolonial critique to the discipline. Since then, work has emerged that critically review the position of the researcher as an insider and outsider at the same time. So this question of methodology might be discussed later, but as well for the discussion um, on Friday. A discussion which I consider not only to be a practice within the classroom, but as well to decolonize the production of knowledge in regard to its theory production, to its staff within the university, and to disciplinary boundaries. So what do we mean when we think about decolonizing urbanism? Do we want to decolonize urbanism? And does that mean to decolonize our understanding and conceptualization of the urban? Or do we want to change the planet and look at the city or the urban in a colonial slash capitalist world order? If we put forward the latter question, the focus shifts from a conceptual and epistemological project of decolonization towards the question, what might the relevance and the role of decolonization imply in that process? The longer I think about the question of decolonization, the coloniality of the urban and cities, the more I wonder if not the abolition of the urban is at stake for epistemological decolonization. Why that? As I have shown before that urban knowledge production within urban studies 
and about the urban and the cities, and in metropolitan studies, reference the cities of the global north or cities of the Western Hemisphere. Seldom cities of former colonized continents are at the core of theory production and of urban studies. The global interdependency is reflected in the division of labor to look at megacities and metropoles, because the main reference to the hegemonic understanding of the urban is the industrial city of the last 100 years. So urban space in post-colonial Europe is not only a living space of the metropolitan society, making a difference between themselves and others. Urban space is not only a space for representation of European history and national museum. Urban space is not only a commodificated infrastructure for globalized financial and tourist industry. Urban space is as well a space of self-organization, of self-determination and of resistance against institutional discrimination, state violence and capitalist exploitation, seeking to reproduce colonial relations in urban Europe. The daily life of racialized and migrant communities are witnesses of the challenge to develop strategies against immobilization on the labor and housing market and against racial profiling in public space, against spatial confinement of refugees, and I could name so many more examples. But these daily strategies aim to resist and carve out possibilities of self-determination against the colonial reproduction. And it is the analysis and the description of colonial relations in daily urban life which sheds light on the resistance of diasporic subjects and from where processes of decolonization may develop. A perspective of decolonization identifies and labels colonial relations to interrupt the reproduction. Intersectional approaches are of utmost importance to understand the simultaneous and ambivalent uneven processes. But the very foundational question which I like to pose here, does decolonizing urbanism include to think of the abolition of the city? And as when we consider the urban as a strategic site of capitalist and neocolonial headquarters. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much Mo, for the presentation. I have a quick question. You mentioned uh, this concept or idea of territorialization. And could you maybe say a few words about how you would see that as related to the urban and the production of urban space? Like it is a sector of capitalism, I understand, it intersects with a lot of other processes. But what would you see as driving forces behind it? Is it investment, which you say it's capitalism that makes territories, or how would you relate these things? It's very hard to differentiate, it's either or. It comes along in conjunction. And if you look in particular at how social politics are working, um, I'm thinking very particular on um, uh, quartiers management in uh, Berlin, which is a social policy, and it's very much territorializing social problems within the city. And um, so it's not about a specific group of people like who have a problem in accessing the university or so on. It's defining social problems within the urban territory. And that um, informs other areas within the city that there are territories free of social problems. And it legitimizes to, to have specific urban developments in there. So it's very hard to say it's either this or that. It comes along in, um, in a cooperation. And that what I see m that many times it's not just um, the, the, invest the, the investor is coming in or the cop capitalist um, money. Um, but social politics, local administration are preparing the ground that specific urban development can take place there. Um, and then you were asking uh, a question about decolonizing. 
case. And I was thinking one, one thing that since was, I don't know, if it was that um, something you didn't engage as explicitly, uh, you're talking about the European identity, you, you said it's not, if, if I remember correctly, not analyzed within the critical racism and post-colonial theory, I completely agree. But one thing that we have, we have a legacy in, um, in so-called Europe of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a thorough analysis of all clocks, of the labor movement, of uh, both Marx and Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, also a, a entrenched critique of imperialism, uh, which, is, which is also something that you didn't kind of, I don't know, you can't touch about anything. But what is your relation to that kind of, that tradition of thought, which you would say could be European, and how it can be, so kind of the, the formation of labor movements with the diasporic spaces, that potentiality of intersecting those two lineages in decolonizing these systems. So I think it's a question of class, which I didn't really hear. Uh, and, um, and your question at the end is that I think So you, you hinged it in the European identity on something which seems to be much more from a viewpoint of, I don't know, the elites, uh, whereas there is another kind of formation of identity which around labor movements across Europe. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. Actually, um, I could understand your question a bit kind of why does not migrant diasporic people learn from labor movements? No, no, that wasn't what I said. That, that sounded really pessimistic. <laughs> no, it's uh, be, because I was, I was, I'm, I'm putting that very, I'm putting that very, uh, in that way because I'm also thinking of activist struggles, which I know. And what I think is a problem, and I think it's part because I didn't refer that to that, is that I'm looking at um, all the theory around labor movement and also on the activist uh, level, I'm wondering why there is such a hard resistance to learn from post-colonial studies. And that's um, why I'm proposing that so much and somehow omit um, that critical uh, approach because, um, and I think that it's very imp uh, interesting to look at how the conversation have taken place or not having taken place. And, um, and what is, uh, from a labor movement perspective, the notion on imperialism and a critical approach on that and to bring that into conversation. That's what, yeah. yeah, but... Um, I, didn't, I, I don't say it's happening here. Yeah. But uh, the potentiality of it is interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I see several cases, not in the answers. <laughs> 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 Uh, Jennifer? Jennifer, do you want to Oh, and it goes back to the topic of um, frontier management for yeah. uh, sort of labor for development. Um, your, I mean, I, your critique is interesting, but in a way it's sort of allowing for or legitimizing uneven development within the city or perhaps even preparing for capital and investment. On the flip side, though, there are a lot of It's not to say that all what's happening within this project is bad, but I think on a long-term perspective, the question is what can come out of these criteria management? And they don't have a long-term perspective. They are in there for like a specific time and then they might leave the neighborhood and whatever. So actually for the people within, it's the question what to build up after they leave. And I also know that there is a huge frustration because that area where they have some kind of influence is very uh, limited. And if you look at Berlin, if there were different um, locations of criteria management and then they became interested to have a comparative approach to their own work and to relate whatever that neighborhood with the other neighborhood, that actually became kind of a dangerous conversation and it was not really supported. And um, so I think the part of territorialization is look at that neighborhoods, look at these um, problems over there, but don't relate these problems to, for example, to the investment, to 
the center of Berlin. I mean, there is a huge investment which is going to the historical district. But other part of neighborhoods, actually, they experience some kind of disinvestment. And um, so we could ask whether these criteria management are part to disconnect these different uh, processes. Mm -hmm. My question is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Please uh, raise your voice if you don't hear uh, what the people asking questions are asked. Anything else, for example? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, my question is about the, uh, the relation of identity and territory within the city. Mm -hmm. So, my question is if. Uh, the ideal or the utopian decolonized city, would that look like a melting pot or a salad bowl? A melting pot or, or, or a salad bowl? I mean, do we have different <laughs> identities, you know? Do we have Chinatowns in the city or do we have completely denatured, completely acculturated, integrated cities? I would be very happy if I could answer that question in that way, either or. Um, actually, to me, it's very, very unclear to see a future of Europe or a future of a decolonized Europe. I really have to admit. Um, because on one hand, I see the very strong connection um, of Europeanness to the territory mm -hmm. and to think of all people who came in as being the others and constantly, constant, constantly being others. So if that wouldn't take place, what would that mean? And as well, that would mean um, also not to think only about question of identity, but also to think of question of property rights and citizenship rights. Mm -hmm. And that what I was also kind of uh, digging into that direction. What would an perspective on some kind of sovereignty from a diasporic position within Europe, what would that include? I mean, if I think of settler colonial context, it's very much easier, but diasporic people are considered as people with no land. So what is the connection and relation then? And that actually is to me a huge question. It's very open and I couldn't say it's either that or this. Um, but I think it would include a large process um, of building up new relations and because it includes question of citizenship and actually also the question of national borders and how that could be re rearranged and so on. So it's not easy to <coughs> answer that question. thinking it is a, actually a device of welfare state. Mm -hmm. yeah? And um, relating it now within the geopolitical, current geopolitical context, um, Trumpism, <laughs> to come back <laughs> and who is doing now the housing mm -hmm. uh, part in, in this context. And we're thinking about this notion of territorialization and deterritorialization and we need to be, I mean, it's quite a difficult conjuncture in which we need to Italy. Mm. So, of course, you would look at the kind of critique towards the welfare state from a critical race perspective, from a decolonial perspective. We see that the welfare state in Europe has, uh, was built on this notion or the myth of a white, European, and ethnic, homogeneous Europe. So the migrant doesn't appear as a citizen. So what racialization and racism does also regard to the labor movement in Europe is to re-establish a notion of what you being mainly male uh, subject, you know, because also women's movement mm. needed to say, well, it's not just the male worker, and especially authoritarian 
in Clinton is also the, the women and children working in the factory. So, um, of course, we, we do have this kind of continuity going on, even in new movements like in Spain, in Podemos, mm -hmm. uh, where still the notion of migration is something external to Europe. It's not something that Europe is part of, and also what you mentioned, the colonial part in it, which is not remembered. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting how the, the projects of maturity are reiterating the imperial and colonial glorious, glorious movement mm -hmm. moments of history, even uh, the Humboldt building, which is happening now <laughs> within the conjunction of the colonial critique yeah. and within the context in Berlin that is very active in decolonizing the city. Still, the implementation of a genealogy, and even in a time when Merkel say, yeah, we need to talk about African colonialism, German African colonialism, still this project is getting a lot of funding and it's being established in a way it's being established as, as a white supremacist, we could say, kind of project, uh, creating or in, including or co-opting mm -hmm. notions of uh, the other in a more way. So it, we, we are in this kind of very difficult conjuncture, but then also when Trump comes in, say, well, well we, let's talk about the communication. We don't need anyone negotiating the yeah. public sphere. We don't need to talk about social housing, which at the moment also in Germany is getting less and less. So I was just thinking about how do we intervene with a decolonial perspective that doesn't open a door in order to uh, create a liberalization of the space, but also put the commons into the center yeah. and the responsibility of any kind of uh, state regulation in order to say, well, you know, it's about commons and it's about maybe a, a Decolonized perspective on the, on the Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Um, I, I was just also thinking about um, the housing market in, in Berlin yeah. and also the protests around the housing market. Um, but I think there is a, um, what's the fortile? Um, an advantage. Thank you. Um, that actually in Berlin most of the people are on rent, that they're renting their apartments. So it's very different to organize a resistance against uh, the rise of rent. If I would compare that to Toronto where most of the people have to buy their apartment and they are in debt. So the individual risk is, or the risk is so put so, so much on the individual uh, level that it's a very different um, process to organize resistance against that. And um, yeah, I, I mean that's what kind of the argument I was making that we really need to differentiate between the different contexts, mm -hmm. um, although we might learn from each other, but um, the welfare situation in Europe makes a huge difference if we look at Canada or United States. Mm -hmm. and that might also make a difference in, uh, in the process of the um, resistance and what's going on on the ground. Um, because also many activist groups are dependent on public funding. But being dependent on public funding means also that you can discuss with the public administration what are the goals and what are their political strategies. It will be very different if these groups are funded by private institutions, which also happens. And so you have a very different political understanding who should serve whom. And um, yeah, there are many open topics, yeah. There was another question. I think you may have already partly answered it by saying that it's difficult to answer. But I'm, um, I really, because I'm coming myself from a settler colonial context in Canada, I'm really interested I really appreciated how you talked about um, both the importance of understanding differences in, in context, in, in historical context and current context, but also how they can speak to each other and how um, um, how organizing and resistance can, can learn from each other. But so coming out of the North American context, there is there's for example this great article that's called Decolonization is not a metaphor. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thanks for the remark and also the discussion groups. Maybe in the afternoon we are also ready to discuss more together and with different experiences also across Europe and the um, African continent, South America, <coughs> Southeast Asia. And there. There's a question here. And um, I kind of think about um, how the space and place is being contested when, when you think of the notions of decolonization and urbanization. It seems to me, like I, I can give an example, in the States there's um, certain communities and places that are refusing to remove the relics and the icons of the slavery days in the Confederacy because that is part of their identity. So it seems like in part of the, epistemo the epistemology um, includes this notion of um, recreating the space and the place and their identities and so if you don't have a place to transition to what your new identity is you are not resistant to releasing this identity as part of this decolonization so it seems to me that part of the struggle is is that there's not this acceptance yet of what the new identity would be and, and kind of what your kind of want to know what your experience with that is that is that maybe part of where the resistance is so maybe this you said that part of it is including a discussion, so maybe is that part of where the discourse needs to be also with this notion of decolonization in the urban context is maybe discussing what these new identities would look like? Um, that's, I think what actually makes it so hard and what you're hinting to by saying the new identity that it's so it kind of very vague to what to expect what decolonization might be or look look like um, somehow we have these processes of decolonizing the urban but actually are more on the um, on the level on street renaming where I think it um, as Julie was just including it doesn't entail um, demands of redistribution the redistribution and so on. So I think we need to think of very new arrangements and also these arrangements will include new identities. Yes. But how to get there to imagine ourselves to be a new identity? Um, I don't know yet but on the other hand I know that we carefully have to understand how identity are part of oppression regimes and how they play out also against each other and, and that we need space to, um, to rethink of the construction of identities um, but also to, um, to see the political relevance within that. Um, so it's um, actually it's a it's fascinating to think about the new, but what the new could be and um, what it might look like, I have, I have no idea. And perhaps I'm not sure whether that answer of the new might be developed from and in Europe. Perhaps it need to be happen somewhere else. And actually, that is also a question if we think of decolonizing. Um, is that a European project? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would put a huge question mark behind that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I was fascinated by the example you gave of the way in which um, people's physiognomy was being um, tested to provide evidence of the diversity of the population in a sort of positive way. It reminded me of course the way in which exactly the same tests had been used both in this country during the Nazi period and in other places, South Africa, for example, under apartheid. And I think the point, the purpose of the discussion that that really draws attention to is how context and intent become so important and certain technologies or certain devices, certain constructions, urban forms are inscribed with meaning in precisely that way. And so the same piece of technology, the same element of urban form, the same device could be both a source of oppression and exploitation and liberation of minds and, 
and so on, depending on context and purpose and the power relations that surround them. And I think that's really a kind of important point that sort of underpins not just this discussion, but actually the, the whole week and the whole idea of decolonization or post-colonial or decolonial or whatever. And then just a kind of response to your earlier question, why is it so damn difficult to persuade most people in urban studies about the importance of what we're engaging with here? And for me, the answer is very much the same. It's very sad to say that, but very much the same as the challenges people working on colonial urbanism or decolonization processes in the past in former colonial territories had getting this brought into or accepted as part of mainstream urban studies. Because for most people, it's something else. It's out there, it's area studies, it's an other room, yeah. if you like. Yeah. And therefore, with the same logic, which is still dominant in urban studies, as in effect you, you said yourself, they don't see the relevance of what post-colonializing or decolonializing has to the mainstream. So to me, that's the real challenge. How do we actually get some progress on, on, on that blockage? Yeah. I mean, um, as I said, um, I'm, I'm at the Center for Metropolitan Studies, mm -hmm. and uh, what I'm very much interested in is in race and racism mm -hmm. as a very contemporary mm -hmm. form taking place in Europe. Yeah. And through a post-colonial perspective, um, on one hand, to, um, to explain that race is very old, mm -hmm. And um, if you look at the definition here in Germany, which like the main institution of political education is giving, racism is uh, an individual uh, pre prejudice. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And it leaves out institutions, the history, and so on. And yeah. so um, actually there is a, a lot of working against the grain in the classroom mm -hmm. when talking about race and racism, Absolutely. because that's yeah. like the major definition people bring with. And so it's, um, you have to introduce a lot of history, a lot of evidence, and so on. And that is, to me, very important because I'm based in Europe. I grew up in Europe. And um, that, I think, is kind of a, um, a vein to come in and to also pose very critical questions. Because on the other hand, you can have uh, a lot of discussions around post-colonial and othering, but you might leave out the question of race and racism. Mm -hmm. And so there are also these processes mm -hmm. of cooptation and so on. And, and I think in particular in urban studies, it's very important to pose that question because um, so far as, and I also have a background in urban planning, um, that Planning is also a technology um, mm. of power. Yeah. So it's defining where people should live, where infrastructure should <coughs> go, and, and so on. And therefore, I think on one hand, I will see many more European black and people of color going into the planning department and mm. study that, uh, like studying law on one hand. But on the other hand, it also needs to have a more um, kind of colonial awareness about the colonial implication within urban planning and urban study. Other questions, remarks? There is one thing I wanted to add to that, what you said before. Um, um, how the question of measuring and so on and the whole idea of race and how that was played into institution and I was just thinking about that we have now the, uh, the law against discri discrimination and so we have many counseling offices uh, throughout Germany and um, actually here in Germany we don't have a database on ethnic or racist discrimination because if you ask a university to count their students, their staff and so on, on somehow racial, ethnic related categories, everybody's like, no, we don't do that. We did that and it went wrong. So now we're in a situation, on one hand you have that history of there is no racism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has changed in the last five to ten years. But on the institutional level, if you want to show that there is an institutional and structural discrimination, mm 
we have no data. And if we don't have data, we don't have an evidence to go to court. And that is actually a huge dilemma. There is kind of a change now because actually, um, because that law was introduced to Germany because of the European Union, and Germany was one of the last countries to um, introduce that law to their own um, lawmaking. And now they have to make sure that nobody is being discriminated here in Germany. But on the other hand, they don't have really the data. And that's what we're going to see like in the ni next five to 10 years, um, the data and how it is generated. And actually, I know of communication with many black people of color communities, how to generate these categories and how to keep that categories open and that they're not kind of essentializing racist idea and so on. So it's uh, in the making and we will see where it's going. There are no more questions for this session. Maybe we can uh, pick up a lot of the input and interesting and complexities in a way that you also come out in the presentation during the discussion. Um, I remind you of Kanani Boro from Incarnation, for example. She really used the uh, green <laughs> time to have a good example to show to everybody. So please fill in or write or draw, even a drawing is fine, whatever you feel like to uh, write on these cards, we will collect, there are new cards around, this is a, a piece of paper, it's too small. If you're ending, no, we have a little presence, I don't know if it's clear, but we are giving bottles of wine at the summer school, because it happens to be we are in a wine region, so we are surrounded by wineyards, we work with students on a wine earth, uh, on winemaking. We are ourselves part of the university wine yards and we go on yeah, regularly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we cultivate our own wine, but we try to understand it, uh, how does it work. So that's also why we um, yeah, like to give to all our Thank you very much. speakers. Also. Okay. Thank you.